Okay, I think that's just I think that's your side, Anders. So let me start out by saying we do have the unde undesirable public speaking quality of speaking quite fast and sometimes accelerating. So I do have the uh, Q and A open, and I would love if this was interactive. If they're short questions, I'll try and field them as we go. And as Anders mentioned in the introduction, it's uh, it's certainly a hot topic, potentially destabilizing democracy. I mean, it's on the news every day. It's motivated us to to go out and create a startup during COVID. Uh, and there's also been some sort of backlash against social media and tech. And part of what I want to convince you today is to justify why we should uh, all, all make an effort to, to protect that and why, why now is the time for leaders to act. And as a disclaimer, uh, we will look at some big tech examples in this slide, uh, but the, the AI and the engineering at those organizations is world class and we're not here to discredit them in any way. Uh, we're, we're even fortunate to have team members from some of those organizations. So we selected those companies as they are leading the way in uh, engineering and, and transparency. Um, so today I'll try and convince you why content moderation will become a strategic priority. First of all, a little bit about me. I say I'm a software engineer and um, NLP practitioner. Uh, but when I'm not presenting alongside Isabel, introduced as an AI specialist, <laughs> and more broadly, as someone who simply cannot escape building real time monitoring systems. Uh, she landed my first job at a hackathon building a, a monitoring system. Uh, and the first job was to build another monitoring system. And now we're doing it again at Checkstep, but it's, it's great. And I would say, uh, all of the places I've spent time in my career, uh, the news and social media have been of paramount importance. Uh, at Signal AI. Um, news analytics is the lifeblood of what they do, and they've been very successful in forging a partnership between academia and industry. And it's something we're striving for at Checkstep. In that sense, we do want to democratize greenfield research and be, be an example of startups that, that can achieve it. In, in the investment banking world, it's just as important, uh, especially in the real time risk desk where I was based. Um, we're very interested in market shocks from news, real or fake. And as we know, tweets do move markets as well. Uh, on the retail banking side, I spent some time at JP Morgan and they're, they're very interested in brand safety and forging a direct connection with potential customers of the bank. Uh, today I'm at Checkstep and also at Oxford at the Said Business School, uh, where we're designing a technology transformation program uh, to help organizations adopt AI specifically uh, for content moderation. on the same sort of time horizon, I think we've all had a turbulent time and the, the media and the news have had a, a key role to play there. We've had the UK EU referendum. Uh, we've had the Donald Trump Hillary election. We've had COVID-19 and this was when we actually started Checkstep trying to raise awareness of dangerous misinformation around viral health claims and present crowdsourced wisdom so people can educate themselves in, in the wake of dangerous examples like what we saw in Isabel's presentation, Bleach Cures Coronavirus. We, we do believe this has been the catalyst for some legislative announcements, and we will see a change. And as recently as December, we've seen a global trend of um, new laws coming out, and we'll take a closer look at them over the course of this presentation. Uh, and finally, I, I think the, the most uh, severe and perhaps uh, unprecedented event is the storming of the, the US Capitol. So at Checkstep, we're starting a company to empower organizations to grow healthy online communities. We have experience building these systems at internet scale, and we want to make them universally accessible uh, for other online organizations. Uh, we're also privileged to have a research background with Professor Isabel Ogrenstein and Professor Preslav Nakov. So for today, the agenda of the talk, we'll take a look at the motivation for uh, leveraging AI to analyze UGC and some potential applications. We'll also have a look at um, the social landscape outside of big tech and who are the potential organizations who could suffer from the new legislation, harmful content, who may not have the AI centers of excellence uh, that big tech possess. We'll take a look at some of the threats of harmful content and also the dynamic legislative landscape. And finally, some content moderation solutions with a focus on AI. First of all, I want to show you this graph. This graph is from 2009, and it's an analysis of every YouTube video with a five-star rating. And there's an interesting property about this graph is that every single rated video was actually rated five stars. A very small number were rated stars one through four. So they've 
made an iteration on the user interface to allow users to express more sentiment, but it's actually not useful for us to gain a high level analysis. A deeper understanding is required. We need to leverage AI for computer vision tools and natural language processing to understand the content itself. One of the first studies I was involved in was to look at sentiment analysis around the UK referendum. Uh, we are looking at whether Twitter believes it was to, to Brexit or to Bermain. And in the outside press, we very much uh, were led to believe that Remain was um, the most likely outcome. Um, but Twitter was telling a different story and it turned out it was a more accurate story as well. You can see I've highlighted a few areas on the UK map uh, where there's significant overlap between the Twitter sentiment and the actual outcome of the result. Another application, and this was uh, done during my thesis at Signal, uh, was the ability to alert on news events that were anomalous. So we use a pairwise similarity metric to first cluster the news articles uh, to reduce the volume uh, so that analysts can focus on specific major events. And then we also achieve this temporal distribution and we can use features such as the volume of news articles uh, in order to specify whether or not that those are anomalous. Finally, and a fourth experiment perhaps is, uh, can we leverage this as uh, an investment strategy on NASDAQ stocks? And here we have a correlation matrix. Uh, we have social features, it's data from Twitter and stock tweets, and also financial market features. And what you see generally is a very weak correlation uh, especially the positive sentiment and financial return is weak, um, but there is some correlation between the total volume of messages for a specific instrument and the trading volume. So you could potentially use it uh, for that kind of strategy, um, but a more sophisticated analysis is required to, to really uh, make this uh, a successful strategy. So with that said, let's take a look at the, the social plus landscape and so, some of the social networks outside of the, the big tech. So in, in the middle, we have Craigslist. And this was one of the original definitive platforms of the internet uh, for classified ads. And, and they were able to achieve um, a broad number of adjacent verticals in a single platform. But as they become successful, competition emerges by addressing the needs of a specific vertical. So every single one of these subcategories from Craigslist has become a successful sector in its own right. And Checkstep is aiming to help these organizations offer a safe experience. From early conversations, we know all of these different organizations are suffering from varied problems and all of them have some form of content moderation and the solutions differ as well. Social, adding a social feature is a competitive advantage. And we see that unbundling Craigslist actually unlocks internet GDP. For example, Airbnb have leveraged the social feature for connecting uh, homeowners to potential tenants. And their revenue uh, for a single category on Craigslist is, is larger than Craigslist in its entirety. And, and broadly, this, this has allowed for businesses and entrepreneurs to compete in a way that was simply not possible with traditional media. Uh, and we believe this, this is worth protecting. Another example of growth is from Pinduoduo, uh, the fastest ever growing e-commerce startup in China, uh, who, whose growth is actually outpacing some of the big tech organizations. Again, by adding a le by leveraging a social feature, but again, adding a social feature comes with a cost. We'll take a look at some of the threats of harmful content and the true cost of offering a social experience in a platform. We do believe there's two broad types of harmful content, high volume, and high impact. This data is from the NYU Stern report on content moderation. And we're looking at Facebook Q1 2020. Uh, Facebook was selected for this report by NYU Stern because they have the most detailed transparency report so far. On the left, we can see all of the content removed by Facebook during that period, 4 billion examples. And noticeably, the vast majority of the content removed uh, was for spam and fake accounts. And this, this content is an example of high volume, but relatively low impact until these fake accounts actually act. In this small slice here, we explode it to take a look at some of the lower volume 
but higher impact examples of harmful content. Within here, we have several different types of graphic content or not safe for work content and hate speech. Hate speech is renowned for being a very impactful type of harmful content, but it only makes up 10% of this slice here. So you have two types, you have high volume and high impact. And what we notice is there's a difference between engaging in a network where you're, you're working within your, your network of friends and um, organizations such as universities versus engaging in these wide open networks like YouTube and Twitter, where there's some degree of anonymity and a global conversation happening. What we see there is an increase in the proportion of content that's removed for hateful conduct cited as a reason. In the, in the case of YouTube, we have 25% of comments are removed for hateful or abusive conduct. And with Twitter, staggeringly, 75% of all of the accounts that are locked or suspended are either for hateful conduct or abuse. And interestingly, the report highlights that the data on the number of tweets specifically is limited, but with new legislation coming up, we should have more transparency on, on this in the future. So what are some of the impacts of this um, more harmful content? We've seen a dramatic rise in the negative evaluation of China. Each chart here shows a country uh, and the viewpoint they have on China. Uh, the, the blue line is the percent of respondents who express an unfavorable view. And we've seen a very sharp rise in the number of respondents who do hold a negative evaluation. We believe social media has had a, had a role here. In the US, 73% uh, of respondents now view China unfavorably. We've also seen a rise in conspiracy theories, such as conspiracy theories, such as QAnon. And we highlight the point at which COVID-19 occurs. And you see this has been a catalyst for extreme growth in the number of followers on QAnon groups. Interestingly, AI is also part of the solution in undermining this conspiracy theory. Here we have an algorithm which identifies the style of writing and it very much highlights that there is two authors using the pseudonym Q, which undermines the entire conspiracy theory, which expresses that Q is an author who has um, a high level of clearance and that's why they're sharing this information. Vaccine skepticism is another effect that we're witnessing. Here we can see a sharp contraction of participation um, of, of willing respondents who, who, who want to take a vaccine. The, the orange dots here are the August 2020 survey and the purple dots are the December 2020 survey. Um, for, for several countries, we can see over a six month time period, there's actually a reduction in the number of respondents who are willing to take a vaccine. In France, we've seen that number go from 60% to 40%. Another area we're concerned about in content moderation is if malicious actors are able to wield generative AI. We've already seen experiments where GPT-3 has fooled Hacker News and an authored article has made it to the top. Separately, we've seen that viral deep Tom Cruise uh, can produce a, an exceptionally convincing deep fake, although a caveat here is this is a professional imp impersonator and it took several months to produce something this accurate. So this level of quality is not yet widely accessible. Having said that, there is a rise in the number of tools for, for educational purposes and for training purposes that actually allow you to produce virtual avatars. So the, the risk here could be that the volume of content malicious actors are able to produce could out, outstrip the level of defense human moderators are able to provide. So this, these events have caused focus around platform or publisher responsibilities. And it's a change from the protection that was put in place as the internet was growing to allow platforms uh, to remain uh, protected from the content publishers were putting on their site. It's part of a global trend. We're seeing this happen all over the world, but to cover three specific examples, in the UK, we'll have the online harms bill. This includes content such as child abuse, terrorist material and suicide promotion. Um, the content must be removed and limited or the organization can be fined up to 10%. If they fail to remove the content, 
they could actually have their service blocked. And we may see this happen. Um, also, if the content is removed, a reason must be given. So to link to Isabel's presentation, this highlights the importance of explainability, uh, not, not only as a reason to give to the end user, but also uh, to help the content moderators make an educated decision and defend their judgment. Similarly, in the EU, we expect uh, the Digital Services Act. Here, there is a focus on flagging illegal content and the ability to contest a content moderation decision if you don't agree with it. So again, the, the, if the platform makes a decision you're unhappy with, you have the ability to, to appeal it. We're starting to see um, so some movement on Section 230 as well. Uh, and the very first piece of legislation is the, the Biden Safe Tech Act. So finally, we, we'd like to take a look at some of the solutions in, in place today. From the same NYU Stern report, we present the Facebook flow for handling harmful content. Offensive content can be flagged in two ways. It can be flagged using AI classifiers, which are trained specifically for the purpose of spotting content that breaches that, that policy point, or it can be reported by the community. Once it's flagged, it's reviewed by one of 15,000 human content moderators. Um, and if they believe it violates the community standards, it's removed from Facebook. And this is an error prone process. 10% of decisions here are made in error. For high profile cases, uh, they will now loop in an independent oversight board who will be able to override the decision taken by the platform. There's a few trends that are happening here as well. We're seeing organizations place an increased focus on, on human moderators. In 2013 at Facebook, there was only one human moderator per million users. That number has increased 10 times. Today we have one per 160,000 users. And in terms of the role, it's, it's, um, they have 30 to 60 seconds per item to review it and make a decision. And over an eight hour shift, content moderators are expected to review between 600 and 800 examples. So how, how effective is AI? We mentioned that content can be flagged by AI using specifically trained classifier for that policy point. And we see here the percent of content which ultimately ends up being removed, which is proactively flagged by AI. So 90% of hate speech flagged by AI um, before it is reported actually goes on to be removed. Now, this doesn't mean that 90% of all hate speech on Facebook is successfully removed by AI. It's still, it's proactively flagged, but it still goes through a human review process. And also so, some content escapes the moder content moderation. And to, to analyze how, how much escapes, Facebook produced these prevalence metrics. They produce these prevalence metrics by sampling 10,000 examples and measuring the number of content pieces um, that violate a specific policy. Noticeably, in the transparency reports, we don't yet have the number on hate speech, but we see for violent and graphic content, the max prevalence after moderation is 0.1%. So they're having some success in harnessing AI as a, as a tool for, for flagging this content. At Facebook, we want, at Checkstep, we want to make the same technology available for other organizations who want to leverage AI to, to flag the content that's unwanted on their platform. We also, as mentioned, we also want the explainable decisions so moderators are able to defend their judgments and reduce the error rate. This will allow other organizations to stay a step ahead of the dynamic legislation changes we're, we're expecting. So well, why is content moderation a strategic priority? We've seen that social features unlock internet GDP. Platforms face existential threats uh, like the, the big tech deplatforming of Parler if they fail to keep their experience safe. There's a global trend of legislation bringing increased focus on content on the platform. And finally, AI is an effective tool for enhancing content moderation efforts. For further reading, I recommend the, the NYU Stern report on who moderates the social media giants and also the, the Ofcom report on the use of AI in online content moderation. And finally, the Social Plus blog series by Andreessen Horowitz, who profiled some of the success of vertical social networks. 
Thank you very much for listening.